Here's to Main Street, not Wall Street. Here's to being invested in each other. Here's to a return to what matters. Elevations Credit Union. It matters where you bank. Visit us online to see why. My name's Chris Hardy, as Ali said. I, uh, I've, I've, I've seen a few things. I've, I've coached a few people. And uh, one of the things that, is, uh, that I have to acknowledge first off is uh, Oliver Frascona. How many of you have had a class with Oliver? OK, okay great, great. So I got my license in 2003. And one of the first classes I took, obviously, shortly after that was you know, either a commission update course or how to stay out of jail. And Oliver was great for both of those kinds of classes. And I saw him speak, and I thought, God, this guy's such a, he's a consummate storyteller. I actually got to see him in litigation mode, which was completely frightening. And I was so glad that I was on the right side of that deal. Um, but really, I've got to acknowledge Oliver and a number of other people who I have, I am standing on their shoulders. Bruce Gardner here, he's a speaker. And, uh, I'm sure you guys have, have seen him speak, but thank you so much for being here. I know you had a choice of a bunch of different speakers and you're sitting here with me and thank you, thank you very much. I've also got to acknowledge another person who was instrumental in helping create part of this presentation. Her name is Chalice Springfield. She's the CEO of Sears Real Estate over in Greeley. And she started this Start Strong, Finish Strong concept, which was a, originally a 12-week program. And she let me, she kind of, on a friendly basis, licensed it to me, and I did a, I did a course in Fort Collins. And uh, so kudos to Chalice for, for uh, letting me borrow this and, and enhance it a little bit and, and talk to you about uh, sort of how Start Strong works. And really the planning behind it is that it's, it's planning for execution every day. Because you know, every day if you have to decide that you're going to be a realtor, um, a lot of times your productivity is lost in that decision-making process. Because what happens when you're asking somebody to make a decision? What happens metabolically? Your heart rate goes up, you start to sweat, you know, all those kinds of things. So it's planning for execution. It's taking action every day, keeping a logbook of what you do every day. So as part of this Start Strong thing, we would ask the attendees to keep a logbook, and we made it easy because we gave them a notebook and that sort of a thing. And it was interesting. It's like keeping, for me, I've struggled with my weight all my life. And one of the things you learn in weight training school or weight reduction school is keep a, keep a food diary. Oh, I hate keeping food diaries. You look at the end of the day, it's like, oh, wow, I shouldn't have had that second bag of chips or, you know, whatever it happens to be. But when you keep a, a logbook of what you do every day, it starts to help you analyze where change might occur in your business to help you be more productive. The other thing is that this Start Strong program does is it, it helps you build your emotional intelligence. Anybody know what emotional intelligence is? Okay, well, it's, it's sort of a complex psych thing. But at its core, it's developing this voice that sits right here and watches everything you do. And for the most part, undisciplined emotional intelligence does what mostly? Criticizes. Oh, you're going to decide to talk that way. Oh, you wrote your contract, really. You, talked to your, you did your buyer orientation that way. But, but when you start developing that, it gives you the opportunity to be conscious of what you're doing while you're doing it. And if you start to veer off the path, you can just step back and make some course corrections. And that's part of what noticing the patterns of your own behavior can do. Other thing, making incremental shifts in your behavior. That's what this class is about. When we talk about quantum leaps, we're going to talk about what a real quantum leap is. And then making a commitment to achieve a goal, any goal. How many of you want to be top producers? OK, that's cool. How many of you just want to be a producer? You know, I just want to make enough money so I can have a nice life, spend time with my wife, travel, enjoy my family, you know, those kinds of things. That's what I want. Top producing is a whole different, other, different thing, which is cool. It's a, it's a great pursuit, and this will help you get there as well. But I think this can help anybody in their business. So that's what Star Strong is about. And so this is just a small portion of what that Star Strong class is. So where did all this come from? I did not spring from the womb. Larry Kendall, or uh, David Knox, or Brian Buffini. I, I have uh, early on in my career, how many of you know who Larry Kendall is? OK, great, cool, another very popular speaker. Early on, one of the first, another one of the first classes I took, it was the first car convention, actually, I attended. And Larry was offering his ninja class. You guys heard of that ninja class? Um, and one of the things that he said, and again, like all speakers, we borrow from one another back and forth. And one of the things that Larry said 
is that who you are in five years will be a product of who you know and the books you read. And it's like, awesome, I love to read. But I also have to work on the getting to know more people and that sort of thing. And so one of the things that I've done, I've collected over the last however many years I've been in real estate now, 11, 12 years, I've got a library of over 100 books, all of them nonfiction. <laughs> My wife's like, why don't you read a Michael Connolly novel every now and again? It's like, well, okay, but I've just got to read this new thing by Daniel Pink or whatever it happens to be. But what we're talking about today, you can find snippets of all of this in, in these five books. First one, Gary Keller. Gary Keller, founder of Keller Williams. He's written a bunch of books, Millionaire Real Estate Agent, Millionaire Real Estate Investor, um, Change. What was the, didn't he have one on? Shift, yeah, okay, so Shift. But this is his most recent book. How many of you guys have read this, The One Thing? Awesome, so you guys and I will resonate already because we're gonna talk about that one thing and some 80-20 rules. Other book I read way, way back. It's, I can't believe I'm calling this an old book now, but Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Anybody in here read that book? Okay, what's one of the most popular, what's the most easily rememberable or memorable uh, seventh or one of the seven habits? Yep, sharpen the saw. That's the one that always comes to mind for me, sharpen the saw. Uh, start with the end in mind, put the first things first. Those are great, it's such a great way to orient yourself to being effective or being productive. Other book, any Seth Godin fans in here? Um, the Dip came out a number of years ago, and if you can see the subtitle, it says, A Little Book That Teaches You When to Quit and When to Stick. Because part of what we do, part of, our, part of what happens to us as humans, is we get wrapped up in doing as many things as we possibly can. We have 24 hours a day, and we all wish we had 30, or 36, or however many it takes to get all of those things done in the different roles. And Seth talks about scaling that down, scaling that down in a way so that you can focus on the things that you really, really want. And one of the things that's toughest for humans to do, I do this in my coaching, I sit down with somebody and the first question I ask is, what do you want? Almost never does anybody have an instantaneous answer. I get a lot of different answers. Oh, I'd like to be rich, oh, I'd like to travel, cool. What do you really want? What is it, what is it really? How do we distill this down into the thing that will best exemplify who you are, and what you want to be. So that's the dip, really good book, very short. I mean like 90 pages, it's, it's, it's really, but highly effective. This other one, The Power of Habit, Charles Duhigg, New York Times columnist, uh, wrote this book a couple of years ago, I think. I actually got to see him speak at Inman Connect in San Francisco a couple of years ago. Great speaker, great topic. He talks about how habits are developed and why we develop habits. Because if we had to actually think about all the steps that it takes to back out of our garage and go to work, that if we had to actually go through the thought process it takes to actually execute that action, we would be exhausted by the time we got to the next stoplight. So we develop these habits because then our brain can just go into autopilot and take care of these things for us and we don't have to waste any glucose in our gray matter to make sure that this happens. And so he talks about cue and reward and how we, how we set up these automated habits. And, and quite honestly, some of the habits we set up are good ones, and some of the habits we set up are bad ones. We've set up these, may not be a reward, but it's an avoidance of, of pain, perhaps, as opposed to moving toward pleasure. And then the last book, Jack Canfield. Anybody know who Jack Canfield is? Chicken soup book dude. He wrote this other book called The Success Principles. It's a thick book. And it's got, anybody read this book or portions of this book? It's great because you can just sort of like thumb through it and say, okay, well, I'm feeling a little uh, inadequate in my sales position. And you thumb through it, it's like, oh, here, here's a whole thing on how I can feel better about my, about my sales career. So another great book. So I'd encourage you to build your own nonfiction library, but many of the things that we're talking about today come from these five books and many others, but these are the big ones. So here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about change. We're going to talk about how to attend a conference. I think I've caught you guys early enough in this, in, this, in this process that I might be able to help you make the most out of your car convention. We're going to talk about how change actually happens, how we can force it to happen even when uh, we might not want to. And then we're going to talk a little bit about belief boundaries, quantum leaps, practice and innovation, productivity. And I know you guys are like, uh, you're done at 3.30, buddy. This is a lot to talk about. But, uh, well, actually, it's 325, so sorry. 
and productivity. And then at the end, we're going to talk about the one thing. How do we distill everything we need to do into the one thing? Right, does that sound cool? Everybody good with that? I'm getting some nods. Great. Also, I love this charging thing. I think that's so cool. You guys can come in, charge up your devices, tune me out if you need to, blog. Joan Cox is here from Active Range. She's going to blog about this. I'm so incredibly honored. So thank you, Joan. Um, so here's how to attend a conference. I love going to conferences. But pretty much all I do is when I'd set up my schedule, I'd block out the time that I was at the conference. And then when I was done with the conference, I went back to my old life. And I got lots of really cool things out of the conference. But how likely was I to implement the cool things I learned in the conference if all the time I scheduled was just when I was at the conference? Not very likely. You guys, if, if you don't review your notes or, or, or take a look at anything that you've seen today within the next 48 to 72 hours, 90% of it is just going to go off with the cocktail that you drank after you leave here. If I had cocktails to offer you right now, I totally would. Because then every time you were having cocktails, you would completely recall everything that I'm saying right now. <laughs> so schedule time in the next couple of days to review the notes that you're taking. I am, a, I am just an avid note taker. I, I've, I've gone paperless. I use Notability. And I'm scribbling on my iPad the whole time. I don't need any additional paper. I just need plenty of electricity. And then what I do is in the next, like either the next day, or I schedule time after the conference is over and review all my notes. Because when you're scribbling stuff down really fast, sometimes you don't see it. But if you look at it right away, you can kind of make sense of it. But it's amazing how much more empowering the action items that you want to put into place refresh in your mind when you review them after a, couple of, after a day or so. The next thing I'd encourage you to do is schedule a coffee or a lunch or a cocktails. Hello, or cocktails over the next week. One of the things that we're really, really good at as humans is keeping commitments to other people. We're much better com keeping commitments to other people than we are keeping commitments to ourselves. Is that a, are we good there? Are we agreed? Because if I don't tell anybody that my goal is to lose another 20 pounds by January 1st, if I don't make that goal, <laughs> is that really a goal? Do I, am I really going to hold myself accountable to her? Well, like, eh, you're close. You're 15 pounds. It's okay. But if I share that goal with somebody else, like a room full of strangers, you know, then on Facebook or on Active Range, I was going to go, so Chris, how's that 20 pounds coming? All of a sudden, I have, an, I have a built-in accountability piece to my goal setting. It's huge. Now, be selective with who you share your goals with. Because if you share your goals with somebody who doesn't have a strong belief in you, <laughs> they might be a friend. They might be a a relative, they might be a spouse, they might be a parent. But if they don't really believe that you can meet that goal, they might not be the best person to share that with. So share it with somebody who can be a cheerleader for you, who can be an accountability person for you. All right, so two very simple things. In the next two days, review your notes. One of the things I like to do with my notes, keep notes, and then I have a separate note that's just action items. So this is the pack rat me keeping notes of everything that I've seen. And then this is the, oh, I really would like to implement this in my life. Review those after two days. Schedule a, meet, schedule a coffee or a meetup with, with someone else. Fair enough? That's pretty easy, right? Two easy steps. All right, so how does change work? How many of you feel mostly like change is something that happens to you? Like you have no control over what Truly and Zillow are going to do with your listings. Or you have no control over what your child is going to do once they leave the warmth and care of your humble abode and go off to school. You have, you have, you have no idea. So I think a lot of times change feels like something that is imposed on us. Or CREC decides, you know what, we need another form. Which I can see there might be a need for another form. Or we need to expand our buy-sell contract and there are four or five pages just to include all of the disclosures that we could possibly can't. So a lot of times, yeah, a lot of times change is something that's imposed on us. But for the most part, change happens by accident, evolution, or erosion as it may be, mutation, invention, innovation, and intention. An intentional change, I think, is some of the best kinds of change because we are in total control of how that change occurs. So let's talk about things that happen by accident, changes that occur by accident. Percy Spencer, engineer at Raytheon Corp. In 1945, he was at his engineering bench at Raytheon playing with, what is it called? I have it in my notes here. A, 
a microwave emitting magnetron. Because, you know, everybody plays around with one of those on their bench every now and again. And so basically, a microwave emitting magnetron is used in the guts of radar arrays. And so he had this thing going, and he felt a strange sensation in his pants. No, he didn't invent Viagra. <laughs> but what he did notice is that the candy bar that was in his pocket was melting. I was like, well, that's probably not all that was affected by that little radiation thing. But he realized immediately, hey, this would be a cool thing. If we can heat drinks or if we can heat up food, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be cool? And so he was the inventor of the microwave oven. 1945, microwave ovens. They called them radar ranges back then, obviously. So that happened by accident. And did that lead, lead to a whole shift in how people eat? Like a whole generation of kids grew up not knowing how to use a stove, but boy, they could set the time on their microwave and they could, you know, make their own mac and cheese and stuff like that. So that's an accidental change that had huge benefit. We've also got evolution and erosion. So the Grand Canyon, gorgeous, isn't it? Just spectacular. And so in like eighth grade earth science class, we learn about the long-term effects of erosion, right? That this was the, this is the result of billions and billions of years of evolution, or erosion, bit by bit, scouring away at these canyon walls. How many of you have been to Yellowstone Park? Seen the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone? Amazing. One of the things I learned from the ranger there, it was an interpretive guide, one of the things I learned there was that, for the most part, many of the dramatic features that we see in nature are the result of cataclysmic erosion. So yes, millions of years, water, washing array, so on and so forth. But then we have situations like we had here last year. Okay, we've had fire, we've had drought, we've got trees that are, that are weak, and then we have some, a little bit of abnormal rain. So then what we see is this humongous change in the span of four days. Whole cities wiped clean, whole canyons scoured. The Thompson, this is a picture of the mouth of the Thompson Canyon just west of Loveland. Um, the bed of the river is now, I want to say, 8 to 12 feet deeper than it was before. Just amazing kinds of change. So millions of years, yes, but then once in a while we have these torrential rains or we have earthquakes or we have these other components that cumulatively create this cataclysmic kind of change. Then we have mutation. We have the zombie apocalypse, or whatever the case might be. And so the thing about change, mutation, is that it usually occurs at the smallest, most minute level, at the chromosomal level, where something gets you know, a little mismatched, and then we end up with you know, uh, the X-Men. We end up with some mutants. Now, typically, we haven't seen this kind of thing happen. In, in, uh, in, in humans, but we have seen this. Blue eyes. 10,000 years ago, a person was born near the Black Sea with blue eyes, and this person was thought to be pretty cool. I have blue eyes, so I'm not, this, I'm not biased in any way, but this was a mutation that ended up being an attractive kind of thing. And so now you have, you have whole populations in Scandinavia that are blonde hair and blue-eyed people. And yet, blue eyes are a recessive gene. And yet, it, it comes out, you know, because of selective, uh, or, or was it was natural selection. I was going to say selective breeding, but that's really coarse. Natural selection. You know, we see, these, we see these traits start to become more prominent. So that's mutation. That's another change that occurs. So the next few slides have to do with high jumping. And I know you're looking at me and thinking, um, High jumping, really, Hardy? That's, uh, you do not look like a high jumper. But I was, junior high, all the way up through like eighth grade, I was a high jumper. They called me the bumblebee. That's a junk joke because bumblebees can't really fly. So, so you know, I was able to, I was, I was okay. I was a little leaner then. But if you, if you start charting sort of the high jump, the world records in high jump over the, over the last 100 years or so, it's really interesting to see how that progressed. So we've got this, this dude standing here. This is 1912, and he's getting ready to do the high jump. He's standing right next to the bar. Now, high jump, you have to leap off of one foot, so that's always been one of the rules. But do you see anything on the other side of this bar? What's he going to land on? 
So the paradigm at that point was you landed on your feet. So you did this sort of weird scissor thing, and you got over the bar, and you landed on your feet. So that's going to set up some limitations, right? I mean, how, how high can you possibly jump? I've seen some, this video on Facebook, these Kenyan kids. They're going like six feet, seven feet, doing this kind of straddle thing because they don't have any, you know, any sort of landing pad. So they had this straddle thing. And so this is a guy going over the bar. He's going over. It's very dignified, very gentlemanly, and he lands on his feet. Then we've got 1912, this guy, George Horeen, goes six feet, 6.7 inches, and he's doing this thing called the West, I think it's called the Western Roll. Is that right? The Western Roll. And so rather than landing on your feet, you're kind of hurling yourself over this bar and you're landing in a three-point position. So you land on your feet and, and, your, and, your, and, and one arm. And again, uh, what's he landing on? <laughs> Dirt, maybe a little sawdust, it's horrible. I can't imagine having to do that. And then invention came along. And what invention came along that probably revolutionized more than anything else? High jumping and pole vaulting. Yeah, yeah, foam padding on the other side of the bar. Wow, that's awesome. Because now what we can do is we can start innovating a little bit in terms of how we get our bodies over this bar. So on June 29, 1956, the seven foot barrier was broken. Charlie Dumas. Hurls himself over, and now he's doing, he's doing a different thing called the straddle. And so instead of sort of going over and just rolling himself over, he's going up and, and he's getting one, driving one leg up, and he's rolling over, and then he's landing on his back in this padded, this padded thing. And so he goes over seven feet. This is another dude. He goes 7'4", 1977. And now we have an innovation. And anybody who knows anything about historic high jumping, knows who I'm going to talk about next, and that's Dick Fosbury. Absolutely right. So Dick Fosbury couldn't do, he couldn't do the straddle, he couldn't do the western roll, and he's like, coach, what if I go, what if I do it this way? And so he goes up, drives up, arches his back, kicks his leg over the bar, and the coach is like, as long as you can go 7-4, I don't care how you get yourself over the bar going one way. So Dick Fosbury, because he had he wasn't capable of doing this technique that had been used for a lot of years. Decides to do this. Dwight Stones, another sort of famous high jumper, he goes 7-7. Seven, seven. Same technique. The Fosbury, the Fosbury flop is what they called it. So they wouldn't be able to do this without that invention of the pads, the foam pads. And then to get even higher, to innovate on that invention and start altering the technique a little bit. So then we have this, this guy. Javier Sotomayor, he's Cuban. Well, let me just show you. Let's go to the next slide here. This is, the video's not very good, but it is uh, pretty amazing. Boom, boom. Look at where the bar is. Hello. Does that seem possible? I mean, that's, un you know, that's just raw footage, but this guy is, I mean, he's like, I don't know, I think he's 6'6", maybe. And he just goes up and over that bar. So just to give you some perspective, that bar that he went over is that mark on the wall. There's no way I'm getting my 200 pounds, some odd pounds, up and over a bar like that. It doesn't matter how strongly I believe that I can high jump over that bar, right? I can, I can do all the positive affirmations. I can do everything in the morning right to you know, set my mindset so that I'm going to get myself over the bar. But without a ladder and an ambulance and maybe a, a trampoline, I am, not gonna, I am never going to do that. And I don't think that this Javier guy started out do high jumpers start out at their, do they, you know, enter the meet and say, yeah, I'm pretty good at eight, I'm just going to start there. Do they, do they do that at a track meet? No, where do they start? They start at a height they know they can clear, right, because they want to stay in the match, and then they incrementally work, their, work, work themselves up. So that's how innovation and those kinds of change. So when we look at this, this chart, and there's a point to this, I'm getting to it. When we look at this chart, 1895, under two meters was the world record in high jump, because remember, they're doing that weird scissor thing. And so we have, we have a, 
couple, you know, a couple of jumps up here. Then 1912, the Western roll is introduced, and boom, we have a big jump in world records. And then we have this completely flat period from 1912 to 1937. What kinds of things do you think contributed to the overall flat world record going on there? Yeah, there was no change. There was no, there was no change in the technique. We, we didn't have foam padding yet. We had this little thing called World War I, so all the able-bodied men were, you know, likely shooting at each other rather than practicing high jump. We had another little thing called the Spanish flu. Took out another couple million folks. Three million folks, maybe, worldwide. So people weren't really focused on high jump so much, I think. But then in 1937, this guy innovates a little bit, jumps it up. We're over two meters. Now we're in, let's say, late 60s. Fosbury introduces this thing. But there's a jump, there's a, there's a bump here before Fosbury starts doing his thing. And what is that? What's the change there? Foam padding, right? They, start, they introduce foam padding in, in track meets. So we see a bump, but then it kind of flattens out. Then Fosbury introduces this. Now everybody's doing the Fosbury flop. They go up, flat period, and then we have Javier who jumps that up to 8.3. And that was in 93. So it stays, that, that's, that's the mark now. So there's a couple of things going on here. We're looking at change. We're looking at technique. We're talking about innovation. We're talking about a lot of practice and little tweaks. A book out now talks about how, for the most part, drug, you know, drug enhancement aside, the technology used in track and field events is what's driving world records now. Michael Phelps, unbelievable athlete, knows exactly how, I mean, the dude won a gold medal without goggles. His goggles were full of water, and he did it because he knew how many strokes he was away from the finish to make his turn. Crazy, crazy stuff. I mean, we don't, when we think about our own practice, you know, do we hone it down to that refined detail so that we know at any given point with certainty what the next thing is going to happen? We're dealing with humans who are making irrational decisions, so oftentimes we can't. But if we were to get our business to that level, can you imagine yourself doing, being a little bit more productive? So, so Michael Phelps, but is Michael, could Michael Phelps win the, the world records that he has? without the equipment that he wears, those shark skin suits that cut down your, your resistance in the water so dramatically? I don't know, but I think there's quantitative folks out there who are saying yes, the technology, the shoes, the track. You know, when Jesse Owens won the 100 meter dash, they were running in actual cinders, and his shoes were just, you know, regular leather shoes, heavy shoes. So the technology has changed and allowed us to increase this. So let's talk a little bit about intention. Intentional change. Okay, good. I've got a half an hour left. So when you think of a quantum leap, what's the first thing that comes to mind? I say quantum leap. You say, wow. Okay, wow's good. Any TV watchers? Anybody, anybody remember this dude? Scott Bakula, quantum leap. You know, so when we think of quantum leap, we're thinking of something that's what? Big. This is a huge leap. How many physicists do we have in here? How many science people? Someone with a science background. Math, that, that almost counts, doesn't it, as science? No? A quantum leap, we, when we talk about quantum, quantum is the very smallest, indivisible piece of something. So when we talk about a quantum leap, we're typically talking about subatomic particles that are making a change from one state to another. And when it may, you know, and usually we see the well, we see, we see this. And so we have these electrons circling the atom, and these electrons stay in this orbit unless they're acted upon by some outside force that changes their state, and then they jump out to another orbit. And usually when they jump out to another orbit, a little release of energy, very, very small, but if you line those up, it can end up being a very, very powerful energy release. So when we talk about creating intentional change in our own lives, for the most part, this is what we are. This is, this is who we are. You are X, I am X, and I am the product of my actions, my feelings, my behavior, and my abilities. And for the most part, all of that is built in this world of experience, the world that I know. 
You ever heard the phrase, you don't know what you don't know? I love that. It's super confusing and oftentimes not very helpful. So this is, this is kind of where we can be. This is where we are. This is my world of experience. And then outside of that is the world of possibility or the world of fantasy. And so many times we set goals that are in that that are outside our world of experience. And because they're outside our world of experience, it makes it very difficult to attain these, wouldn't you say? Because we don't, we don't know the steps to get there. We haven't intentionally changed who we are or what we do to get there. I love that I'm a film producer. Anybody shot an iPhone video recently? You are now a film producer. Anybody edited a video? Tours? There's lots of things. I'm a writer. Anybody blog other than Joan? Anybody write emails? We're writers every day. So part of it is kind of shifting your view a little bit too. But our belief boundaries are really strong. This, this little ring out here, it's like ironclad. And to break outside of that is very, very difficult to just sort of hope and, you know, hope at some point maybe I'm going to be something other than what I currently am. So how do we do this? How do we expand our belief boundaries? Well, the way we do that is through the same thing that creates who we are, through actions, feelings, behavior, and abilities. And the really cool thing is when we have an experience that is sort of outside the norm, this really interesting thing happens is our world of experience automatically expands. And now that we've had that experience, we want to have it again. We want to try and repeat that. One of the biggest challenges for the astronauts who went to the moon, James Lovell wrote about this brilliant, he comes back from the moon, or. Uh, yeah, was it James Lovell was the Apollo 13 guy, right? Carpenter. One of the guys that went to the moon. Sorry. But when they came back, it was like, I've been to the moon, man. What else, what else is there? What else is there for me to do? And it created some challenges because they couldn't go to Mars. They couldn't go back to the moon. But for us, when we have a really cool experience and we want to have that again, now we have to take actions to, to get there. Because now we have this experience of either higher performance or more productivity or um, uh, improved relationship with our, with our spouse or significant other. So feelings work that way. Behavior works that way. We start to develop a habit that might improve our productivity. I might start choosing to eat differently so that I'm in a caloric deficit instead of the opposite. And then we look at our abilities. We might go to a class. We might sit in a class and then we might follow the, instructor and it, the instructions and review my notes after a couple days and set an appointment with somebody to go over what I learned. And so the really nice thing is our world of experience can expand. We can have these quantum leaps periodically and enjoy that, that release, okay? But we have to be willing to undergo that. If, what we're, if all we're willing to do is the same old thing day after day, you know, we have this sort of odd Protestant work ethic of if I toil every day, I'm going to be rewarded in the end, right? Isn't that sort of the standard Protestant work ethic? If I go to work every day, I'll be rewarded in the end. But the challenge is, if I go to work every day, and I'm doing average work every day, am I going to enjoy above average results at the end? I don't think so. I don't think the math works out that way. I don't think life actually works out that way. At some point, I have got to do some above average stuff if I'm going to enjoy an above average existence. So it takes time. You can't do this overnight. How many people have heard, I'm sure none of you have said this, but how many people have heard somebody say, yeah, I'm taking the weekend, and I'm going to get totally organized. Totally organized. Anybody? I say that almost every weekend, and, it's not, and it never happens. But the thing that does happen is, if I start making agreements with myself that all along the way, I'm going to change the way I handle certain aspects of my life, then when it comes, then... I've got this habit built in. I'm not choosing to do it every day, and it just becomes automatic. And so this brings us to the one thing. Gary Keller had a, 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 an epiphany on a plane. He was watching City Slickers, the original City Slickers. And that point in the movie when Billy Crystal and Curly are out on the range, and Billy's, you know, in his midlife crisis, and he doesn't know what to do, and his career's in the toilet, and his wife isn't happy with him, you know, the whole thing. And Curly says, well, you know, the secret to life is one thing. Billy's like, what is it? You know, and then he's 
helping birth a calf and all this other stuff. And Curly says, well, that's, that's what you've got to figure out. So that's the tough part. That's the tough part. What is the one thing? What is the thing that I want most? And that's where I think having a coach, having a mentor, having a confidant, someone that you can chat with about these things openly can really be helpful. Well, what Gary found is that success is built sequentially, just like we saw the high jump guys. It's, it's sequential in, its, in nature. And he talks about the power of dominoes. And how when you, you, know, you lay out these dominoes and it's really cool and you set them all up and then you just barely touch one over and then it, it releases all of this energy across everything else that's standing up. And the thing that's really cool is it's geometric in nature. You can have a, do a, a regular sized domino can tip over a domino twice its size and that domino can tip over a domino twice its size. And so if you pick the right dominoes, you can enjoy with very little effort in the beginning you can enjoy huge results on the back end. So let's talk about intentional productivity. Now this is out of the Seven Habits book. So there's that quadrant piece that he talks about in terms of, that Stephen Covey talks about in terms of overall productivity. We've got important things that we have to do and we have not important things that we have to do. And then on the other axis we have things that are urgent and things that are not urgent. And so for the most part, where do you think we spend most of our time? A lot of times when, when we're on Facebook, we are not important and it's not urgent, but boy, we spend a lot of time there somehow, vicariously living through other people's drama. Don't get me wrong, I love Facebook. I, I hang out there quite a bit, but it can be a time suck. And so they name these quadrants one, two, three, and four. And one of the most productive quadrants that you can spend your time in is on stuff that's important, but not urgent, quadrant two. These are called quadrant two activities. This is a great thing to make a list of. What are my quadrant two activities? But we can't escape the things that are urgent and important. The call from school. Hey, Junior's uh, not feeling well. So you have to set everything that you're doing aside and go handle that. So urgent and important, crisis, pressing issues, deadlines, meetings, all of those kinds of things. Not urgent but important, preparation, planning, real relationship building, personal development, all of those things. Quadrant three, not important and urgent, interruptions. How many of you get instant notifications of emails on your phones? I would suggest turning that off. It's a complete distraction. The only thing that is really good at handling two problems simultaneously is a computer. Your brains exert a ton of energy moving from one task to the other. And if we don't, fin you know, people who say mul that multitaskers get more done than people who do things one at a time, it's a myth. It's a myth. So that's one thing, distractions. If you can minimize your distractions, you'll increase your productivity dramatically. Um, texts. Texts are the only thing that I still get instant notifications of, and even those are becoming a pretty regular distraction. And then we have quadrant four, which is not important and not urgent. And sadly, we spend a lot of time, I mean, TV, holy mackerel. You know, some days I get home, I have a little dinner, and then I am out for the next four hours. Blacklist. New Girl, whatever's, you know, grim, all these TV shows. I end up, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an admitted television junkie, but, you know, that's, those are things that we have to monitor if we're going to get better. So the other thing Keller talks about in the one thing is this, you know, think big, act big, and you'll succeed big. It's that whole idea of if I just do average stuff, I'm going to end the day average. Supremely average, a lot of good work, but it's probably not where I really want to be. So when we set these big outcomes versus a small outcome, we keep thinking that, okay, there's a lot of time and effort involved in getting there, but there's ways to mitigate that. And the way we start to mitigate that and we start to get our mind around this thing is using this idea called the Pareto Principle. It's also known as the 80-20 rule. And basically it's the idea that 80% of our results come from 20% of our activity, right? 80% of our business comes from 20% of our sphere or our past clients. But the thing that Gary Keller did in this book or talks about this book is why not take that a step further? Because the Pareto Principle is a fractal. So a fractal is, is a pattern that's represented even as you, as you scale down to the quantum level. So you've, got your, you've done your first round of, okay, I'm going to look at what are, what are the 20% of my activities that bring me 80% of my business. Then I'm going to scale that back again. What's the 20% of the 20% that's going to bring me that, that result? And then you do it one more time, and you get to this idea of what's the one thing 
that I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary. And if we started living our lives in that manner, if we started scheduling our days based on the one thing, based on that, this is another, another uh, that kissing that frog, for example, if I know that if I take care of that thing that I know is going to move my business forward and I do it early in the day when I've got plenty of energy and plenty of resilience, I can, spend the, I can do the whole rest of the day doing other things that enliven my life. It's huge. It's, I, I was reading this on a plane and was just so completely transfixed. It's like one of those things that you know intuitively, but then when somebody actually writes it down, you read it's like, oh my God, this is brilliant. So it was an epiphany for me as well. And so raising the bar is really, how do you create that nonlinear change? How do you create that cataclysmic event that just automatically propels you forward into your next, into your next thing? Well, first of all, it's determining what that one thing is. Use the Pareto Principle when you're planning. Use the Pareto Principle when you are talking about your prospect list, when you're doing a geographic farm. What part of this town, what part of my sphere of influence is really going to be the most productive for me, and how can I reach out to these people in the most effective way? Develop a new technique. Look outside of your own industry. Practice a lot. We don't practice. Well, actually, we do. But who do we practice on? We practice on our clients. You know, I, I, I said earlier, I teased earlier that we we're going to do small group work and we we're going to do a lot of role play and like half the people got up and was like, I'm out of here. We hate role play. We hate it. And mostly it's because it's, it's usually delivered poorly. It's hard to get role play to be meaningful. But it can be really, really valuable. As you're moving through, make minor adjustments to what you're doing. If you're in a listing presentation or if you're doing a buyer orientation and you find, you're, you find that you are losing your audience, I mean, this is why I'm a wanderer and I try to make some eye contact with everybody because inevitably, you know, everybody's doing the iPhone for prayer and that kind of a thing. But, but back up. If I'm, if I'm losing you, I need, to, I need to stop the world and back up and go, okay, are you guys with me? Because this is really kind of cool and I want to make sure that I help you reach your goal. Because you can do that at any point. And people will be really appreciative of it because then they get that you're listening to them. Even if they're not saying anything, you're still listening to them. Be green and growing. This is a chalice phrase. I love it. Chalice, uh, Springfield, the gal I mentioned earlier. Be green and growing and not ripe and rotten. It's so easy. I love, there's this movement on Facebook right now to like post pictures of flowers. You guys seen this? Because they want to disrupt the constant uh, barrage of negativity on Facebook. <laughs> Good luck. We need a lot of, a lot of flowers out there. But um, one of the things that I like to do is I start getting that negative vibe when I'm on Facebook, unfollow, unfollow. It's not I'm unfriending, I'm just not seeing that crap anymore because it makes me, it doesn't, it doesn't enliven me. It just feels, you know, drama and all that kind of thing. But this, it, it goes for beyond just social media. So obviously if you've got people around you that are, you know, ripe, not ripe, uh, either, either help them out or get away from them. Pay the price. Now, that doesn't mean get out your checkbook, but it means if it's going to take time, if it's going to take some energy, if it's going to take finding a co coach, if it's going to take, you know, asking for help. We're horrible, usually, at asking for help because we think that asking for help demonstrates weakness. But asking for help is one of the best ways to help the energetic flow of goodwill and good nature and prosperity. That if you don't know how to ask for help, you're actually shutting that down and preventing your own self from enjoying some prosperity. So uh, be willing to do that. At any given moment in the day, think about which quadrant am I in right now? Am I in, ur am I in not urgent and not important? And if so, is it okay? Can I spend 10 more minutes here before I go to you know, something that is important but not urgent? Look outside your own industry. And the interesting thing, I mentioned Chuli and Zillow early on. If we, if Chuli and Zillow didn't exist, how many fewer homes would be sold this year? We would sell the exact same number of homes. And so everybody's really up in arms about this whole truly emerging with Zillow and this whole thing and third party syndication. I mean, you've got to make your own choice. But Truly and Zillow were, they looked from outside our industry in and went, oh, wow, really? That's how that works? Get a couple of code jockeys in here. Let's fix this. I think we can make this search thing more enjoyable for consumers. So they saw a need and they filled it. So what can we look at outside of our industry where they really get customer service right? 
where they really get understanding what the customer needs are. Another great book, Tony Shea, CEO of Zappos. Anybody order Zappos? <laughs> okay, it's an awesome company. Amazon bought them, but they, sell, they started out selling shoes. And their customer service is unbelievable. And they've created, they've created ways to anticipate when I might need another pair of shoes. Hey, Chris, you bought this pair of shoes a year ago. How are they doing? You might need another pair. Oh, by the way, here's the pair that you ordered. And for the most part, I could have worn these shoes for a year and returned them, and they would have given me a full refund. It's a crazy, crazy good company. So look outside your own industry. If you have friends in the healthcare industry, if you have friends in the insurance industry, you know, ask them to coffee and say, hey, you know, what, are the, what, what makes you successful? What are the elements of success in your business? It can be really pretty eye-opening. Don't be afraid to shake it up. Innovate, you know. If you can't do the Western roll, figure out if you can do the Fosbury flop, and if that'll drive your business forward, it can be pretty impressive. Again, look to others who are successful. Not necessarily in your own industry. You know, look outside that. Figure out what are people doing? How are they thinking about the world? How do they think laterally to solve various customers, customer service issues or contract issues or negotiating issues? And if nothing else, focus and minimize distraction. That is the single biggest drain on our lives. Because for the most part, our brain power is finite every single day. Ask anybody who's having a glass of wine at 4 o'clock. They'll tell you, oh yeah, it's a busy day, big day, a lot of thinking, a lot of talking. You know, since I'm of the male persuasion, I have a finite number of words every day. And sometimes I come home at the end of the day and my wife Pat will say, so how was it going? That was good. Uh, dude, I haven't seen you in eight hours and that, I'm, I'm getting good. It's like, well, you know, man, I just, I talked to a lot of people today. Oh, so you're out of words. Kind of. Okay, I get that. And, and this is a relationship we developed, and she's super, she's super, um, and super tolerant of me. But, um, but then, you know, it's funny because I'll be sitting, and I'll watch a little TV, or I'll, I'll relax a little bit, and then I start telling her stories 30 minutes after she's asked me a question of how my day was. And I start telling her stuff. And then, and so then we have a great conversation. But it's, but it's knowing those things about yourself and acknowledging those things about your partners and your clients and figuring out how to leverage that so that you can help them be what they want to be and do what they want to do can be tremendous, tremendously valuable. You guys get out 10 minutes early. This is just the beginning. This is just a snippet of sort of what that Start Strong stuff is. But take a look at those books. The PowerPoint slides are online. At the, at, you can download them from the Car Convention app. Um, if you have any questions for me, my business cards are on the back. Um, thank you so much for choosing to spend uh, about 50 minutes with me. I really appreciate it. Hope it can help you as you finish out this year strong and prosperous. Thank you so much.